Well, please turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel. We're in John chapter 7. will be verses 14 to 24, but I want to read beginning in verse 1 to verse 24. So John chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Amen. Well, let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day. We thank you for the house of God on the day of God to worship with the people of God. And we pray that you would be glorified in this glad hour. We pray that you would forgive us now for all of our sin and unrighteousness, that darkening influence that it casts upon our minds. And may you fill us each with the Holy Spirit. May we know his presence and power. May you guide us and lead us into all truth. And may you make much of Jesus Christ, that one who is altogether lovely and chief among 10,000. We thank you again for your mercies to us, for your grace revealed in the gospel of our salvation. We pray that today would be the day of salvation for sinners here and throughout the world. We pray that your word would run swiftly and be glorified. And we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, last week we looked at John chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, the Feast of Tabernacles. And in verse 1, we see it says that after these things, so the things recorded in chapter 6, about six months prior, Jesus engaged in ministry in a synagogue in Capernaum, according to John 6. Well, now he's in Judea, specifically in Jerusalem, and he attends to the Feast of uh, of Tabernacles. And in verses 14 to 24, we see first the authority of Christ. They question it, and then he sets it forth. We see that in verses 14 to 18. And then secondly, the intention of the Jews. Jesus directly confronts them. Remember back in verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. His time had not yet come. If you look specifically at verse 30, we see that. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Make no mistake about it, Jesus came to live, to die, and to be raised again. But he's on the divine time frame. He is not going to be led astray from the mission at hand because of godless men. He is committed to do the will of the Father. That is his meat. That is his delight. That is the purpose for which he was sent. 
So again, two things this morning, the authority of Christ, and then secondly, the intention of the Jews. So let's look at the authority of Christ in verses 14 to 18. Remember in the first place, the setting of his teaching. Verse 14 tells us now about the middle of the feast. So it was a week long feast. Jesus has now come. He didn't come openly, but he came secretly. Again, not to gain attention for himself, not to draw attention to himself, but rather to do the will of his father. So in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Feast of Tabernacles is given to us in the Old Testament. The primary emphasis is to recall the exodus from Egypt. So God's people went into bondage. They went into Egypt for a series of, uh, of sins and crimes ultimately against God. And there is chastening and judgment. And then they come out under the hand of a merciful and power, powerful God. And so this Feast of Tabernacles was a time for everybody to gather in Jerusalem. Those from without the city would build temples, or not temples, but tabernacles or booths or tents. And they would celebrate, and they would rehearse the reality that Yahweh of Israel broke the back of Egyptian oppression and brought them into the liberty of God's blessing. And so this was typological, pointing forward to that new exodus, the exodus wrought by Christ when he brings his people out of the bondage of sin and misery and depravity. So this is a time of feasting, a time of celebration, a time of rejoicing. So in the middle of the feast, now Jesus begins to teach. And it is ironic because the word became flesh and dwelt among us, according to 1.14. Remember that religion in Israel at this particular time was destitute of any saving power. They were formalists. They were externalists. They simply went through the motions. We know that from John 2 when Jesus goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers. He drives out the beasts. That was an indictment. Religious worship in Israel was at a low ebb. And so ironically now, the true tabernacle of God is among men. They are celebrating that feast which pointed to him, and all the while they reject him, they despise him, they abhor him. So the setting is absolutely important for our understanding because of that reality. The one whom the, the, the feast pointed to, the one who is the ultimate deliverer of his people, is right there in their midst. And instead of bowing to him and worshiping him and serving him, they say, how does this man know anything? How does this man have any understanding? He has never been taught in the rabbinic schools. He didn't go to university. He didn't go to college. He's the son of a carpenter. So they disregard him. And then they ultimately accuse him of being mad or accuse him of having a demon. So notice then the source of his teaching. So, well, well, first of all, the question of the crowd. They marvel at his teaching. Remember that in verse 11, they actually sought him out. Then the Jews, this is probably the hoi polloi, the common folk, not the religious leaders. The Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Now, John tells us in verse 14 that he taught. Doesn't tell us what he taught, but based on the rest of the gospel, we can understand. He taught concerning the kingdom of God. He taught the, 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 the means by which God receives sinners unto himself. In other words, he taught law and gospel as he was wont to do in his earthly ministry. So that evokes from the Jews this response in verse 15. The Jews marveled saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? Again, the emphasis is simple. He wasn't a rabbi trained in their schools. He wasn't one that had gone on for undergrad degree and then a, a postgraduate studies. He didn't have a lot of letters after his name. He was not accomplished. He was not approved. He was not sophisticated by the understanding of that particular time. You see a parallel construction in Matthew's gospel, a chapter 13 and verses 54 and 55. It says, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? It's a good question, brethren. When somebody comes to speak authoritatively, they speak not as the scribes did, according to Matthew's gospel in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, but he taught as one having authority. So they're basically saying, where did he get this authority? Where did he get this ability? Who has equipped him for this particular task? Remember, a similar indictment is made against his apostles in Acts chapter 4. It says that when the apostles Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin says, when they saw, or the text says, now when they, the Sanhedrin, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's the primary emphasis in terms of gospel ministry. It doesn't matter where the letters come from in your particular name in terms of degree. It's presence with Christ. 
It's worship of the true and living God. It is walking in faith with Him and loving and honoring and serving Him. Reading good, and obviously the scriptures, but then good theology. That's why we're a confessional church. We subscribe to a historic document that does summarize the main teachings of God's Word. Teachings that the church has agreed upon throughout our inception. It is a wonderful methodology by which we cultivate, hopefully, an understanding in Bible and an understanding in theology. So again, back to this context, they're just blown away. Where did he get this authority? How does this man have this wisdom? He wasn't trained in our schools. And now notice the source of his teaching. And he lays out three particulars that need to be considered. First, the unity with his father, verse 16, the reception of his word in verse 17, and then the mission of the son in verse 18. Remember, this is a threefold response to this question of verse 15. When they say, how does this man know letters having never studied? So the first emphasis is the unity with his father. Look at verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Now, at first read or first glance, we might believe that Jesus is distinguishing himself from his father. He's saying, I'm not teaching you anything that, that is what the father intended. But that's not what he's saying. He's underscoring the unity that he has with the Father. In other words, my doctrine didn't originate with myself. My doctrine wasn't learned in your rabbinic schools. My doctrine wasn't achieved by a, a, an internet site where they sent me my degree after I paid the fee. My doctrine is the doctrine of him who sent me. Now go back to John 5, there's a parallel construction. John 5, in which this particular chapter, chapter 7, and our section goes back to in terms of some, some parallel thought. Remember that the Jews were upset because Jesus healed this paralyzed man on the, on the Sabbath day. Instead of saying, praise God, this man who had been bound for 8 and 30 years is now able to walk. Instead of glorifying God, they got upset with him. They got upset with this man. They got upset with Jesus. And now they want to stone Jesus for Sabbath breaking. And because he being a man made himself equal with God. So notice that specifically in verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. How does Christ respond? Does he say, oh, no, that's absolutely incorrect. I am not equal with the father. I am a completely other thing. I am not what you suggest that I am. That's not how he answers. He takes the next long section in John 5 to underscore that he is one with the Father, that he is consubstantial with the Father. And as readers of John's gospel, we already know this because John 1, 1 begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? He was God. He's one in substance with the Father. He is equally glorified and honored with the Father. But notice in 519, then Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So far from Jesus saying, I am impotent, Jesus is underscoring that he's omnipotent. He says he does nothing of himself, but he does it in perfect union with the Father, because each has the divine essence, not divided, not shared, not partialed out, but the Son is one with the Father at the level of substance or deity or divinity. So going back to John 7 at verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. And that's another way that the Lord often refers to himself as the one sent by the Father. The one sent by the Father has the authority of the Father. And therefore, when he teaches, we're supposed to listen. We're supposed to submit. We're supposed to respond. When Jesus says later on in this particular passage, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Now, the thirst there isn't physical. It's not temporal. He doesn't say, if you're thirsty, go upstairs and fetch a drink out of the faucet. No, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. There is never a crime or never a sin or never a problem in a sinner responding to Jesus. Coming when he says come. Believing on him when he says believe. That is hyper-Calvinism, which teaches that when he says that, he doesn't really mean it. You just stay. Stay away from him. Resist him. Continue in your unbelief and in your rebellion. Now, when Christ says, if any man thirsts, 
let him come to me, then because he's invested with the authority of God himself, we're to respond, we're to believe, we're to repent, we're to come to the blessed Savior who does satisfy that soul thirst better and only than any other thing can. Believe you me, you talk to a believer and you say, what was it like before you were a Christian? Well, I had this and I had this and I had that, but God saved me and I don't have those things anymore. Well, do you feel bad that those things are gone? Oh, no. Look at Paul in Philippians chapter 3. What things were gain? These I've counted lost. They're, 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 they're rubbish. They're, they're that which is fitting uh, to throw to the dogs. Now I have Christ. I have everything in the one who is altogether lovely and chief among 10,000. So the source of his authority, the source of his teaching is the fact that he is the son of God, the sent one of God. So the declaration in 519 is not one of impotence, but rather of omnipotence. And here the declaration is not one of difference or limitation in doctrine, but rather equality in doctrine. Matthew Poole says, but it is mine as it is the doctrine of the father that sent me. And I and my father both are one and agree in one. First John 5, 7 and 8. To hear the son is to hear the father. So Christ answers in what would later be in, in, in enshrouded in the Nicene, uh, 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 the Nicene Creed. Jesus' authority comes because he's God from God, light from light, true God from true God, being of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made. So where did this man get his authority to teach as he did? Because he is the son of God sent by the father to come to preach and teach his blessed doctrine. Notice secondly, the reception of his word, verse 17. So he underscores the unity of the, with the father in verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. And now in verse 17, it's intriguing. He says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. One man said it this way, the Jews challenge the ability of Jesus to teach. Jesus challenges the ability of the Jews to hear. See, here's the problem. If anyone wills to do his will, if anyone has been born again, if anyone has been drawn by the powerful grace of God, if anyone has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to have any disparity between the Father's doctrine and the Son's doctrine. They're going to see it as the self-same doctrine. In other words, when the Spirit of God works in your hearts to make you a new man or a new woman, when the Spirit of God gives you the graces of faith and repentance to close with the Savior, the Spirit of God leads you to a worship of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So notice, Jesus is questioned concerning his authority, and now Jesus questions them concerning their ability. So verse 17, if anyone wills to do his will... Later, or earlier, look back at th uh, chapter 321. Chapter 321, these sorts of people are described as those who do the truth. 321, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. The Jews even stumbled on this in John chapter 9. You can turn there to verse 31. Now, they are saying it in a way that is vilifying their sort of comp uh, competition in terms of theology. But notice in 931, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper, I'm sorry, this is the man. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper, worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. So going back to John chapter 7, Christ is saying something that would get him kicked off university campuses today and get him thrown out of the political arena. How, how dare you question the hearer? How dare you actually think that there's something wanting in them? You're, you're obviously the problem, Jesus. They're, they've all you know, thrown up their hands and wonder, where, where did this man get this knowledge? He's not studied. He's not been trained in the, in, the, in the particular universities or college settings. He says, if anyone wills to do his will, the question will be so, uh, settled. If anyone wills to do the will of the Father who sent the Son, you're not going to stumble with reference to the Son. He who has the Father has the Son. He who has the Son has the Father. Go back to John 5, the same emphasis in verse 23. 
that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. We're not supposed to honor the Son with just about as much honor as we give to the Father. No, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences or three persons. We honor Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equally. That all should honor the uh, Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That sheds light on his statement in verse 17. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. In other words, to reject Christ is to reject the Father. So a lot of religious people in this world, a lot of people that actually not so much anymore. It's not religious, but I'm spiritual. I'm, I'm spiritual. It's such an anemic and weak term to describe something that is alien and contrary to Holy Scripture. It really doesn't matter the object of worship. It just matters that I worship. It doesn't really matter the object of my faith. It just matters that I have faith. No, that's absolutely contrary. You need to worship the true and living God, and you need to come to the Savior King, the Lord Christ, in faith, because that's the only way of salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. So this answer to people that say, well, you know, I, I, I love God, and I serve God, and I'm spiritual, and I'm religious. Well, what think ye of Christ? Well, well, I'm not one of those Christians. I'm not one of those born-againers. I'm not one of those weirdos. I'm not one of those Bible thumpers. Well, then you're not his. Because if you reject the Son, you reject the Father who sent the Son. And Christ says, if anyone wills to do his will, then the matter will be settled. Is the word of Christ divine? Absolutely, positively. Why? Because the Father sent him. He sent him in the fullness of the time, uh, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. So when they said, how does this man know letters? He says, you're unable to answer, understand my letters even if I teach them because you're not born again. You haven't come to me. You haven't believed. That is a prerequisite. We must be born of the Spirit. The apostle in 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. What is Christ teaching? Christ is teaching that dead sinners don't respond to his word. Christ is teaching that when you are in that depth of depravity, when you have that corresponding inability to come to him, unless the father who sent me draws him, unless the father who sent me calls him, unless the father who sent me awakens him by the power of the Holy Spirit and gives him the graces of faith and repentance, you'll never, never understand the word of Jesus Christ. So when they say, how does this man know letters, having never under, uh, 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 studied, he says to them, you don't have the ears to hear. You don't have the wherewithal. And it's not just at the intellectual or cognitive level. He's not saying you're a bunch of morons and you couldn't understand two plus two equals four if I spelled it out to you. He's saying you don't have that spiritual discernment. Sin affects in such a way as to promote or produce deadness in the sinner. That's why in Ephesians 2, you being dead in your trespasses and sins, who gets praised for awakening dead sinners? It's God most high. Never does the Bible say good on you for making yourself alive. Good on you for the decision that you've made. Good on you for raising your hand at that, that altar call. Good on you for signing that card or, or registering online that you're a new believer. The Bible never does that. It tells us it does not depend upon him who wills or upon him who runs, but on God who shows mercy. Jesus taught this to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This shows that all of us are dependent upon God. All of us stand in need of God's grace. All of us need what Christ taught, uh, talked of in John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Same emphasis in John 6 at verse 65. So Christ hasn't forgotten these lessons in the synagogue at Capernaum. They undergird the entire teaching ministry that he's about. He wants to show sinners that they don't have the wherewithal, but God has the grace. He wants to show sinners that they don't have the ability, but God has omnipotence. He wants to show sinners that they ought not to depend upon their own resources or upon their own works, but upon God most high, who sent the son of his love to live, to die, and to rise again. 
So to the, uh, to the question, how does this man know letters? First, because he is one with the Father. Second, because they are unable to understand his word. But then notice thirdly, the mission of the Son in verse 18. He says, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. That's an obvious, you know, sort of a thing. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time here. We're all like that, right? We all like to shine the light upon our own ability, upon our own knowledge. I mean, there's actual social media now that's been founded to advance that absolutely unworthy cause. We get to tell everybody every day everything that we're ever doing. That is native in the heart of man, to glorify ourselves. That is native in the heart of man, to try to steal from others, to try to steal from God that which belongs to God alone. So Jesus lays this down as axiomatic in, ver in the first part of verse 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But that's not why Christ came. He's underscoring his mission. To the question, how does this man know letters? It is for this reason I have come to declare the Father. Again, this connects us back to John 1. You can go to John 1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So going back to chapter 7 at verse 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Christ is not on a mission to get glory for himself. Whatever glory he speaks of coming to him glorifies the father and the spirit. Because in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. But notice, he who seeks the glory of the one, or but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him. Christ uses that terminology so that we'll never forget his specialness, his divinity, his consubstantiality or union with the Father. And then notice, he says that he, uh, the one, uh, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. So whatever you Jews who are opposing me may think, Jesus knows that he's telling the truth. Jesus knows this because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the language of Psalm 31, He is the Lord God of truth. There is no lie in Him. There is no, no falsehood in Him. There is no badness in Him. And that's how He ends this section in verse 18. There is no unrighteousness in Him. Now, this particular statement looks back and it looks forward to what's going to happen in this dispute with the Jews, to which we now turn the intention of the Jews. Notice, first, he confronts them in verses 19 and 20, and then secondly, he defends his ministry in verses 21 to 24. Notice the confrontation in verse 19. They're questioning him about his authority. They're questioning him about his training. They're questioning about him, him about his pedigree. How does this man know what he's talking about? He hasn't done all the things that our rabbis did. He, you know, he's the son of a carpenter. He's just like one of us, basically. Who does he think he is? Jesus doesn't leave it there. He answers their question. Unity with the Father, the, the, the reality that you must be born again to receive his word, and the, the fact that the mission of the Son is to bring glory to the Father. He answers their charge. But now he turns the cannon back on them. And he questions their ethics. They're wondering about his authority. He's wondering about their ethics, their ethical rebellion to the true and living God. You've got a lot of nerve to question me. He doesn't sound like this, and he doesn't probably talk like this, but this is probably the spirit in which he said it. Like, who do you think you are? You're asking me about my authority, and you want to kill me, an innocent man, a holy and a harmless and an undefiled man? the only innocent man that has ever walked the face of the earth? You, you really have the chutzpah that, that people claim concerning the Jews. And that's precisely what he does here in verse 19 and 20. Notice his charge, verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Let's not forget this, okay? You guys are the covenant community. You are the inheritors of the oracles of God. You are the proud possessors of Genesis to Malachi. You have the Holy Scriptures. You have what God has given. You have the revelation of God. You claim Moses as your teacher. You claim the, the Pharisees are consistent with Moses. And yet, you want to violate that law in your hatred and opposition to me. 
So he says in verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of, none of you keeps the law. That's a general statement. None of you, whether Jew or Gentile, keeps the law. Just read Paul in Romans 1.18 to chapter 3 and verse 20, and you will see that all men everywhere are under the just condemnation of God because they don't keep the law. That is generally true. There's nobody that, it's, that has escaped the sin of Adam. There's nobody that's escaped total depravity. There's nobody that's escaped total inability. There is none of us that come out of the wombs always wanting to obey the law of God, always saying with Jesus, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. That's not us, generally speaking. But notice the specific transgression that they themselves are guilty of, and he calls them on it. You're asking me about my authority. He says, why do you seek to kill me? Again, this brings us to verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Go back to John chapter 5, the healing of the man at Bethesda brings us to chapter 5 at verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also made or also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So the Lord Jesus presses them now. The Lord Jesus asks them about their conduct. As I said, he turns the cannon back around and says, I want you to answer this particular charge with which there is much evidence to corroborate. So notice how they respond. The people answer. Now the people here is probably the hoi polloi or the multitudes of verse 11. They are not the religious leaders, but their answer or their response indicates now their solidarity with the religious leaders. Remember when Jesus comes to the Feast of Tabernacles at verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no one, on, no on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. The fear of the Jews there in verse 13 is the religious leaders. So verse 20 may start to be indicating this slide. The hoi polloi, the, the, the multitudes, the general commoners, now they're starting to show solidarity with the religious leaders. And this is what we see in the latter part of all the gospel narratives, this rising animosity to our blessed Savior, which culminates ultimately in, the, in his crucifixion. Notice, the, uh, the people answered and they said, you have a demon. Now, this is what it says. You have a demon. The spirit of Beelzebub is in you. Uh, later on in chapter 10, you can turn there. It's translated uh, 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 differently. And probably it has the same sort of meaning here. It has the same sort of semantic range. Notice in chapter 10 at verse 19. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Same sort of situation here in chapter 7 at verse 20. They ask him specifically, or they, they, they answer and they say, you have a demon, you're mad, you're out of your mind, you don't know what you're talking about. Who's trying to kill you? Well, just because they don't know that the religious leaders are trying to kill them doesn't mean it isn't so. But they are showing now their hand in terms of solidarity with the religious leaders. It's slow and it's gradual, but it's ultimate because at the end of John, we find them crying out in unison, away with him, away with him, crucify him, which again shows us the power of persuasion of our religious leaders, right? These men hated Christ. Does it surprise us that the people they taught, the people that followed them, the people that attended their synagogues would hate Christ as well? The very Messiah promised by God, the very Messiah specified in the Old Testament scriptures, the very one has come to his own, but his own receive him not. And so they are expressing this union with the religious leadership, which is showing that this is an increasing contra uh, uh, conspiracy against Christ. Now, notice the defense of his ministry. And again, we have three things here. First, the healing of the lame man. Second, the appeal to Moses. And then third, the standard of judgment. Notice first, the healing of the lame man. He points back to that man in Bethesda. I told you there was a, a strong connection between this section in John 7 and what happens in John chapter 5. So verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. 
right? They all marvel. This man had been uh, paralyzed for 38 years. He'd been hanging out by the pool of Bethesda. And when Christ alights on him, he says, well, there's nobody to help me into the water. He's kind of the victim there. He's kind of the whiner. He's kind of the moaner. I, I just couldn't get in there on my own. So Christ picks that one man out of many, and he heals him. And notice that Christ refers to that and says, I healed this man. And you all marvel. What, what happened? What, what's become of this? Well, now he appeals to Moses, which is common among the rabbis. The fact that he appeals to Moses shows that he didn't need to go to their schools to outsmart them. He didn't need to go to their schools to, to best them in argument. He appeals to Moses. And I think that sometimes commentators convolute this and make it a lot more difficult than it needs to be. But look specifically at verses 22, uh, 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 22 and 23. He says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. He appeals to circumcision. It comes from Abraham and God's dealings with him in Genesis chapter 17. God had made a covenant with Abraham and he, he affirms it and he gives this particular sign in Genesis chapter 17. It became binding upon the Jews. It was something that became sort of a, a badge of national identity. You got circumcised to be a, a participant in the covenant community. That's a no-brainer. That, that just happened. That's the way it was. So he says, Moses commands you to circumcise, and it's perfectly acceptable, and it's perfectly okay, and it's perfectly lawful to circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Now, probably the backdrop here is the very intention of the Sabbath. It seems to me, based on John 5 and based on what Jesus does here and the Sabbath wars and the Synoptic Gospels, typically today, Christians who have a problem with the Sabbath think about the Sabbath the way the unbelieving Jews did. They think about the Sabbath the way that the, the Pharisees did. We don't think about the Sabbath the way that Jesus taught it in Mark's Gospel. He says the Sabbath was made for the man and not the man for the Sabbath. When he says the man, he's talking about Adam. Sabbath predated Sinai. Sabbath is there at the original intention of God Most High in making the world and all things in it. He displays by his own example in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, God, this, God the Lord Sabbaths. He's enthroned over the creation and he finds complacency and rest in that. But with reference to the Sabbath in the Jewish mindset, it became a series of rules that man was made to fulfill. That's why Jesus says in Mark 2, the Sabbath wasn't made for the man. God didn't say, I'm going to make this Sabbath, and then I'm going to just make sure that they have to jump through every hoop, they have to imbibe every jot and tittle, and I'm going to crush them if they don't. No, the Sabbath was made for the man. Imagine that. The creator of the world said, I'm going to give you a day to rest. And in that day to rest, you're going to worship me. You're going to glorify me. You're going to get to be with your brothers and sisters. You're going to get to say with David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So Jesus says that if circumcision is appropriate on the Sabbath day, I made this man whole and you've got problems with that. Remember, he upbraids them in the synoptics with the illustration over the ox or over the donkey. If your ox or your donkey fell into a ditch on the Sabbath, would you leave it there? Would you say, I'll be back for you tomorrow morning, uh, uh, beast of burden? No, you'd fetch him out. You'd pull him out. You'd show mercy to him. So Christ comes in John 5. He heals this, this man at the pool of Bethesda, and they lose their minds because it's the Sabbath. It's not that he broke the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. It was always God's intention that good could be accomplished on the Sabbath day. Read the prophet Isaiah and the indictment concerning the fasting of Israel and the Sabbath keeping of Israel in Isaiah 58. The last part of Isaiah 58, it's about doing good. It's about helping. It's about thinking about God most high, rejoicing in him. So the argument is a lesser to the greater. 22 again. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, and it's not, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? It's an it's a absolutely positively beautiful response and answer. 
if you guys are the, 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 the spawn of Moses, the, the religious pedigree of Abraham, if you are the covenant community and you have this great and glowing respect for the law of God such that you feel you can challenge me based on my authority, what about the law of Moses? You've got a problem with authority at the most fundamental level. You reject and resist Moses, and you now want to accuse me of having a demon and being a madman and ultimately wanting to deliver me up to be crucified? Is this a threefold response? He first highlights the healing of the lame man. He appeals to Moses, and then he brings it home with great power in verse 24. There is a standard of judgment, and you men are found wanting. There is a standard of judgment, and you men have missed it by a long shot. Notice, he says there is a wrong way to judge, and he says there is a right way to judge. The wrong way is clear. Do not judge according to appearance, especially appearance that is as faultily informed as yours is. We cannot operate the world, way the world does at this particular level. Judgment is an absolutely necessary part of life. If you doubt that, come back tonight because we're going to look at Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5. The church makes judgments according to Matthew chapter 18. The civil government makes judgments according to Romans 13, 4. Everybody makes judgment at some point or other. But we're not supposed to do it based on appearance. We're not supposed to do it based on feelings. There's a popular commentator today that says facts don't care about your feelings. Where do you think he got that? He got it from the objective standard of God's holy word. Exodus chapter 23. You're not to, supposed to show partiality to a poor man. If I'm a judge in a courtroom and some poor slob comes wandering in, I'm not supposed to say, oh, well, that's okay that he committed armed robbery because he's some poor slob. No, justice is supposed to be blind. Justice is not supposed to be based on appearance. We're not supposed to render judgment based on partiality. We're supposed to judge with righteous judgment. Notice the appearance of a situation can be deceiving, especially when you don't know the law. If you assume that Sabbath breaking means you can't heal a, a, a lame man on the Sabbath day or, or you know, fetch your, your, your dog out of a, pit, a, a ditch or your, your donkey or, your, or your, your goat out of a ditch, you don't understand the law. And you really shouldn't judge based on things you don't understand. The appearance of a situation can be prejudicial. Again, Exodus 23, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 1, Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 16. What do we read? Yahweh does not show partiality in judgment. Guess what Yahweh demands from his people? That we don't show partiality in our judgment. A poor man is judged by the same rule of law that a rich man is. The rich man is judged by the same rule of law that a poor man is. Because just as easy as we're typically, oh, you know, this poor guy, I'm just going to rule in his favor because everything's against him. So might we be bought off. So might we judge a, a rich man with a little bit of leniency, hoping he'll make a, a, a donation to our, our campaign. We're not supposed to do that. In the language of one commentator, he makes the observation to show partiality in a judgment is not to give a judgment that is just because of love or deference or fear or the status of a person, which things have nothing to do with the case. Can we ever return to the standard of God's judgment? That's what Jesus calls them to. Don't judge based on appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now, again, in the larger context, they want to murder him. They want to kill him. This isn't simply theoretical in the mind of the Savior. He's not just questioning their ethics. He's not just challenging them at the level of hermeneutics just for some sort of scholastic you know, enterprise. He is telling these men. He is calling these people to reflect upon their conduct. Why? He wants them to see their sin. He wants them to understand their wretchedness. He wants them to see their lawlessness. Why? Because look at verses 37 and 38. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Like he says on the occasion of the, the salvation of Matthew, the Son of Man did not come to call the, the, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
Christ is plowing up the field. Christ is hitting them with the law. Christ is using the law as a child tutor to show them their need, such that when he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. Let him come to the living fountain of waters. Let him come for that satisfaction that Christ and his gospel brings to guilty, vile, helpless sinners, to lawbreakers and transgressors, those who have despised the, the, the written word of God through Moses. He is calling upon them ultimately to repent of their sin, to believe the gospel, and to be saved. In conclusion, the authority of the Savior is seen in his person. That's what he underscores in verses 16 to 18. He is the sent one from God. That is his person. He is the only begotten Son of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, made, one in being with the Father, through whom all things were made. But the authority of the Son is seen in his works as well. The miracles. Now, there have been other miracle workers in the pages of Scripture. One think of Elisha. Elisha is very typical of our Lord Jesus Christ. Elijah did miracles. The prophets, you see that. But they never claimed to be doing it in a way that Jesus did. Jesus asserted his equality with the Father. Moses didn't do that. Elijah didn't do that. Elisha didn't do that. If persons were to ever say to them, you're making yourself equal with the Father, they would have distanced themselves by, by a thousand miles. But Christ owns that. Christ assumes that. Christ confirms that. So the authority of Jesus is seen in his relation to the Father and in the works that he does. And the relation to the Father shows us as well that the doctrine is the same. My doctrine is not mine, but it is the, uh, it is the one who sent me. Secondly, we should focus on the wretchedness of the Jews at this place, not because they're Jews and we hate them, but because we all ape them. We're like them. We are, we are similar. Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. First, they did not have the will to do God's will. Verse 17a, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall. They didn't have that. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. They had not been born again. They had not been called by God out of darkness into marvelous light. Secondly, they did not have an understanding of Jesus' doctrine as a result. They didn't will to do the will of the Father. Therefore, when he speaks, they're suspect. When he speaks, they're suspicious. When he speaks, they actually question his authority to say the things that he's saying. Third, they did not have a commitment to the law of God. Verse 19, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? It really is an interesting contrast that you find in the gospel narratives at the level of the opposition of the, the religious leadership to Jesus. These are the men that claim to be the champions of the law. These are the men that, you know, that, that, that stand out on the street corner and they say, thank you, God, that, I, that I'm not like other men. I'm not a murderer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I, I'm not like these tax collectors. I'm not like these publicans. They really thought they were the cat's meow. It's probably an old statement that dates me. The kids are probably saying, what's a cat's meow? They thought they had it going on and they are confronting the very God of heaven and earth. As well, they did not have a respect for his glorious person. To accuse Jesus in verse 20 of having a demon, we see in the synoptics that that is the, the unpardonable sin. That is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's the one from which people don't come back. And this is dangerous ground for them to tread. They did not have a respect for his miraculous works. As I said, John 5, verses 1 to 13. The man had been incapacitated for 38 years. And now he's out of the pool. He's on his own two legs. He's carrying his mat. And these killjoys, these horrible specimens of human beings are upset with him. They're angry. Well, who, who did this to you? Same thing in Luke's gospel. The Lord Jesus comes to a synagogue on the Sabbath day and there's a woman there who's hunched over. She's bent over. I mean, she's been bound with a spirit of infirmity for years and years and years, which nevertheless, she's in the synagogue on the Sabbath. She's not on her couch, you know, moaning and whining and, hey, honey, bring me a cracker and some soda because I got a sniffle. She was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, even though she's hunched over with a spirit of infirmity. So Jesus heals her. Guess how the ruler of the synagogue responds to that? 
hey, we've got a fellowship hall, we'll get a cake, we'll not get one, we'll make one, it's the Sabbath, and we'll make sure that we have a celebration. No, he lambasts everybody in the synagogue. He wags his finger at them and says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh is the Sabbath of, of God. The, the, the six days are when you come for a healing, not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus again says, which of you, hypocrites, if you had a, do a, a donkey or an ox that fell into the ditch, you wouldn't fetch it out? And he says, think of it, this woman, this daughter of Abraham has been bent over all these years and now she stands before you whole? When you reject or resist the powerful work of God Most High and describe it to demons, you're in a bad place. We ought to rejoice in the goodness of God. We ought to thank him for his mercies. We ought to revel in the things that he does on behalf of people. And they did not have an understanding of the law of God, and that ultimately affected their response to Jesus. Jesus is the one described in Matthew 11, I'm sorry, Isaiah 11, the, the description of Messiah there, tells us his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. So when Jesus upbraids them, when he indicts them, when he tells them, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment, he knows exactly what he's talking about. And yet they were so blinded in their prejudice toward him. They were so upset in terms of their response to him. They charge him as being a madman or being demon possessed. And they're basically saying, we want nothing to do with you. Now, if you find yourself in that particular place this morning, may I encourage you with what verses 37 and 38 say. If anyone thirsts, let him come. See, all of us are sinners. There is none righteous, no, not one. No one in this church that is heaven bound is heaven bound because they're good. I think I can say that safely. Well, I know I can say that safely for everybody, right? We're not heaven bound because we're good. We're heaven bound because Jesus is good. We're heaven bound because of his work, because of his death, because of his resurrection. When he says things like he does in John 4, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. He is talking about the act of obedience. He's talking about his law keeping. He's talking about securing for us an imputed righteousness that is received by faith alone. We need his life, but we also need his death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9.22. Why was the sacrificial system in play in the Old Testament? To teach Israel that sinful man can't just wander into the presence of a holy God. They come through a bloody knife and a smoking altar. Which bloody knife and smoking altar under the Levitical system in the Old Covenant pointed forward to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? And so sinners who by God's grace believe in him have everlasting life. So listen to the words of the Savior. If you're not a believer here this morning, these come specifically to you in verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Christ is a willing Savior for very needy sinners. And if you conclude, well, I've been really bad, been really evil. You know, if you've ever witnessed or you've gone door to door, if you, you've talked to people downtown and you say to somebody, you know, there's salvation to be had in Jesus. You'll meet the odd doc once in a while who says, I, I think I'm beyond hope. I mean, you don't know my life, man. I, I'm really messed up. I've got, you know, lots of skeletons in my closet. I mean, it's just littered back there. I, I don't think there's hope for me. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 at verse 15 says, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world, sinners to save. And then Paul says, of whom I am chief. You're not worse than Paul. And yet Paul on the road to Damascus is conquered by the Savior. Paul on the road to Damascus is saved by the Savior. Paul on the road to Damascus is forgiven of his sins and he receives a righteousness that avails with God. How? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. Well, let us pray. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of the teaching of our blessed Savior. We thank you for the consistent confirmation and testimony of the apostle under inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, one in being with the Father. We rejoice in this gospel. We rejoice in the fact that he lived, that he died, that he was raised again the third day. As Paul summarizes so beautifully in Romans 4, he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. May you be pleased to save sinners today wherever this gospel is preached. And may you look down with mercy, with love, with kindness and compassion here and call sinners out of darkness into marvelous light. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll take your hymn books and turn to 568 and we'll sing the doxology in praise to our great God. Please stand with me as we sing. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for this glad hour. Thank you for the mercy that you've shown us in the gospel of our salvation. Thank you for the glory of Jesus Christ and the power of his life, death, and resurrection. Help us to sanctify the day. Help us to call it a delight. Help us to enjoy the fellowship of the saints and to, to honor you. And God, bring us together tonight that we may worship again in spirit and in truth. And we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, please be seated for a brief time of meditation. <clears throat> 